transcended by this greater way that Christ offers. But what does count isn't your circumcision or pointedly resisting that, saying I'm different, but what matters is faith working through love. What do you think he means by that? Take five or six minutes, talk with folks around you, and then we'll come back together. Thank you. Um, Just thinking about some of the things we talked about. Uh, We looked ahead to chapter 6, verse... Uh, 15, when he says a very similar phrase, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And somehow these kind of complete his thought in very similar ways, faith working through love, a new creation. And that seems like a big point of the letter is there's a whole new thing going on. Don't crawl back to the old thing. And that new thing is faith working through love and that this is something that the law couldn't accomplish um, or could only kind of approximate, and that this is um, to think more broadly of of what Paul's interested in. He's called the apostle of the heart set free, right? The heart is transformed, corrected to the point that it actually wants what is right. That's the new creation that's only possible through the spirit, which is only possible through the work of Christ. And so now that you've been set free, what does that freedom look like? It looks like trust, faith, and that faith that is um, maybe aiming at love, or uh, we use the car analogy of being fueled by love, that it it works. Why does it work? It works because of love, Um, but it still works. Also, you're wondering if love could almost be synonymous with God, that he's giving us his love, because it seems like the same way that he gives us faith um, to have the love um, especially in the next verse about loving one another well, that, that the whole commit, uh, law is fulfilled in that, that sometimes it's hard to love one another well, and that he, um, if we ask him, you know, he can give us his love so that his love can work through us um, to you know, make us more like him. Not denying what was said, but a, a slightly different twist would be to look at circumcision as a mark for, special, for people to be set apart to be servants of the greater world, and through Christ, he, who is ultimately the true circumcised Israel, the one who actually fulfills everything and perfectly, we're all called to be both circumcised to Christ and also, in other words, be servants and also the greater world. So there's an application of this faith work it through love is that we're both the special people to go and spread the gospel and build a kingdom, and we are also this greater world. Yeah, so that idea that we need to have right standing before God, we need to belong to his people, circumcision used to be part of accomplishing that, now Christ has done that, and so what's needed is not just to have those temporal markers, but to become a new creation. Circumcision doesn't accomplish that. Crucifixion crucifixion accomplishes that. So we participate and partake in what Christ did for us, and then we follow in the example that he lives of having fulfilled the law, right? What is, what is the ultimate fulfillment of the law that's clear from scripture, scripture? Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, which is what Christ does. And so we participate in his death, so too we participate in his resurrection, living the life of love that he gives to us, right? And transforming a community on that basis. Okay, um, one, one quick note before we'll get into our last section um, here. Paul's, uh, just again to emphasize the point, Paul is using some salty language all the way throughout Galatians. He's using imagery that is violent. He's saying, I wish these people would castrate themselves, which again is ironic because these are the people saying, you need to be true heirs. And we're probably familiar with Deuteronomy's prescription that those who are eunuchs are not allowed into, right, into the congregation, into the assembly. And so Paul's saying, in your zeal to keep this old way, you are making yourselves unfit for the new life that God is calling us into. There's also some interesting contemporary resonances where in Galatia, uh, the cult of the earth mother that we mentioned last week, one of the sects of adherence practiced self-castration. And so Paul's speaking both as like the Jewish as well as to the Gentile and to the pagan background by the violence and severity of this particular um, of this particular curse that he's calling upon them. Um, let's move uh, right ahead to the ending section. We're going to skip past this this middle part, um, and we'll look at 19 through 25 uh, to the end of our time. Let me read this section for us. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So a, a, few, uh, a few notes on this quickly um, before we get into some further conversation. Uh, so once again, we see uh, Paul talking about the flesh. Um, what does Paul mean by the flesh? He obviously means bodily desires, physical pleasures and passions. But it seems also right to know that he's thinking about the broader human passage. So not just say our desire to eat and drink and be merry, but also that desire for prestige, that desire for affirmation that seems to be motivating the enemies he's arguing against and that which the Galatians are tempted by, right? To be approved according to the standards of man. And those standards, I think, also are what Paul's talking about. What we said last week about the elementary principles of the world. I think Paul also has that in mind when he's talking about the flesh here. Um, uh, to offer another um, quote on uh, from a Galatians commentary, the flesh is the influence of an era and its human traditions and assumptions that have invaded human beings and established a forward command center close to the human will, seeking to claim us as slaves for the power of this age. When Paul uses that language, you not give an opportunity to the flesh. That word opportunity, right, is the word for like the forward command base, the starting point of a military campaign which desires the complete conquest of a particular target, right? Those are the desires that he's talking about that we have to be warned against. And that's an important warning because what previously protected us against those powers? The law. Keep the law and you defend yourself against being overcome by the powers of the world. Again, another quote, the power of the flesh is probably what makes the removal of the bridle of the law all the more frightening and risky. What is to save us from being swallowed up by our own desires, passions, and impulses, if not rules and regulations carefully laid out? Paul's answer will be the Spirit, the divine Spirit poured into our hearts. Rules make sense. Rules keep things clear and organized. They're easy to trust in. And Paul's saying, that's not sufficient for what God is calling us to. That's not sufficient for defending you against the powers of this present evil age. The true freedom, uh, to quote one of the early church fathers, Marius Victorinus, is instead to keep faith with God and to believe all of God's promises which leads us into being able to combat against these works of the flesh. Again, notice that language, the works of the flesh, against the fruit of the Spirit, which will be cultivated within us by His power. Um, um, let's, let's quickly uh, make some comments on the particular vices that Paul observes here. Um, a few things to notice that... Um, Ver lists of virtues and vices are super common in moral discourse in the ancient world. People wrote and talked about and dialed about these things all the time. Paul's list is unique in a few ways. Number one, he includes sins that would have been familiar as capital offenses to the Jewish mind along things like rivalries, dissensions, right? Those things which are punishable by death are included along things that we talk about as like junior high drama. But they belong in the same list for Paul. Um, he also is including things that are pretty uncommon for this type of moral discourse. While Greco-Roman civilization championed the ideal of justice, giving to one another their due, treating others as they ought to be treated in some sense, that's not quite, and in some reckonings, far from the ideal of love. So it's not that the Greeks and the Romans following their philosophy were just concerned with their own inner moral purity and uprightness. They did believe that in order to act as you ought, you treat others as they ought. But that standard is far lower than the standard of sacrificial love that Christ calls us to. And then another unique feature is joy. Right. Joy is such a prominent and repeated focus of Paul in what characterizes 
the life according to the Spirit, what characterizes God's people. And that's just a term that is almost never used in this kind of moral discourse. Um, and it's, it's worth pointing out that this particular type of joy, I think I have a quote um, here, this joy depends not on circumstances, not on the conditions around you, but on the Spirit. Think about his other teaching, right? I've learned the secret of contentment in all times, in all places, in all circumstances. And so it can coexist with those other feelings. You're feeling happy, you're feeling sad, you're feeling invigorated, you're feeling sluggish. You might have joy because it comes through the Spirit in all of those things. And celebration in the Spirit then stands in contrast with many of these vices that Paul is warning against, which have uh, some individual reference, right? Like drunkenness and sexual immorality. Those all clearly describe something that is internal to you individually. But each of these words, almost every single time in this list, they are primarily spoken of in the context of what you do with a group, right? So drunkenness refers to bouts of drunkenness parties, right? So he's definitely saying, don't get drunk, but his concern is what a group, what a community gets ordered around. Right? Some of those words about sexual debauchery have their root in bacchanalic processions. Right, Whenever everybody's gathered together and just letting loose, acting according to their passions, not bridled by any standard of shame or honor. So they have both to do with how you conduct yourself as yourself, but what sorts of things become characteristic, what sorts of things start to organize your life in community together, which again sets in stark relief what he does call us to, which uh, is, if you notice one of the consistent themes of the fruits of the Spirit, how many of them depend on their expression towards others. Right? Again, it's not just your own individual upright life. It's about how you conduct yourself in relationship to others. Um, to get us into, um, we can talk about this for one minute. We can have one good minute of conversation. Um, Here's th three questions for us to think about. Um, I'll just leave them on the screen, but I'd love for you to talk for just a couple of minutes. What do you notice about these two sets of lists contrasted against each other? The works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Talk for 90 seconds with the people around you, and we'll, we'll conclude with this thought. Three very brief thoughts to conclude. One, here's just a cool thing. Whenever Paul says, against these things, uh, there is no law, in some ways he's riffing on Aristotle, writing into politics. Um, much earlier, who talks about a group of people who exhibit uncommon excellence, and he writes of them, against such people as these, there is no law, right? So no one is preventing you from being these people, but also there is nothing which can stand against you if you are such a people, right? There's no power, there's no force, there's no organizing principle greater that, that what can dri than what can drive you. Um, a second thing, again, uh, is fruit versus works, right? The fruit is the product of something else, right? The fruit of the Spirit working in us. So what makes us God's people is not our ability to do as he told us to do, but rather the result of an indwelling power that is at first external to us and then dwelling in us that produces these things that in some ways has nothing to do with, say, the traditional Greco-Roman discourse about you have to seek to know what is good and then habituate your will to act in accordance with that consistently and regularly. What matters is the Spirit dwelling in you, which you ought to abide then in, and don't choke out its work with your own bad ideas and self-imposed regulations about what, what this should and should not look like so you can act and live as that new creation. Let me say a quick word of prayer. Our God, we thank you for your word, which speaks to us today and gives us life. Help us to have life abundantly by your Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.